NCR Corporation is a leader in omnichannel solutions, turning everyday interactions with businesses into exceptional experiences. With its software, hardware, and portfolio of services, NCR enables nearly 700 million transactions daily across financial, retail, hospitality, travel, telecom, and technology industries. NCR solutions run the everyday transactions that make your life easier. NCR is headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, with about 30,000 employees and does business in 180 countries. Well, thank you so much, Maggie, for that introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah, and I'm 18 years old. And today I'm going to tell you all a bit about my journey in science from compassion to innovation, and it truly has been a never-ending adventure. So prior to the summer before my seventh grade year, I had very little interest in science because all I knew was that it was something that you read out of a textbook, took a test on, and then forgot for the rest of your life. But my parents sought to change that by enrolling me in a summer engineering camp right before my seventh grade year. So I walked into the camp that day and I was the only girl in the entire room. I remember I looked at my dad and I was like, are you really gonna leave me here with all these boys? Like, no way, I wanna go back to theater. He said, just try this for one day. And if you don't like it, you don't have to come back tomorrow. So I said, okay, I guess that's fair. And our goal in this camp was to build these little Lego robots. And what really hooked me that day was that the goal was to make them fight each other. So basically, we were trying to knock the other robot off of the platform, and the one that did it the most times would win the contest. And um, at the end of the week, our team worked really hard the whole week, and we won first place in the competition. Now that week absolutely inspired my love of science and it stoked my curiosity and I really wanted to learn more about how I could apply science to real life. So I went home after that summer camp and I borrowed this Lego EV3 kit from my school and I ended up making this. Touch sensor, and when he hits that wall, he's gonna stop. So as you can see, this is some pretty advanced robotics for a 13-year-old. No, I'm totally joking. <laughs> These robots are about as simple as you can get. And when I was in seventh grade, most other kids my age were already years ahead of this. I'm sure some of you are in middle school now, and you're doing stuff way more advanced than this. I would build cool-looking robots that would do absolutely nothing. They would sit there and look cool. But this was a learning process for me. I started from the very bottom of science research. I had no idea what I was doing, but it was some of the most fun I had ever had, was programming and building and seeing ideas come to life life. So I went back to school that fall with the goal to learn as much as I could, and I joined pretty much every science club under the roof of my middle school. Here you see pictures of Science Olympiad, Sea Perch, the Owl Animatronics Club, and the First Tech Challenge Club. Something really beneficial about these clubs for me was that I was working in a team environment. So that's the first takeaway, is if you're beginning in science and you want to learn more, get involved with a team. I've learned so much from the people around me in science, more than I ever could have on my own or out of a textbook. And learning from our failures together that year was something that really allowed me to build up my skill set in science and got me prepared for a problem that came in the mail later that fall. I'd been talking to my friend Ruth, who lives in Ethiopia since I was in fourth grade, through a program at my church called Compassion International. It's a pen pal program where you write letters to your friends around the world. And I'd been talking to Ruth in the fall of my seventh grade year. I received the newsletter you see on the left-hand side, which is about how she was living in energy poverty with very little access to electricity. And this limited her access to things like sewage control, like lights to study by at night, simple resources that living in the US I would take for granted. I had no idea that this problem existed until I got this newsletter. So I said, okay, I really want to do something about this problem. And I live in Florida, so there's water like everywhere. And one day I was fishing with my family and I saw this giant yacht get turned around by the current energy. And I was like, that's weird, that's a big boat. And it got turned around just by water power. So I thought, okay, how can I use water power to apply it to Ruth's problem? So I spent my entire eighth grade year developing an ocean energy probe to essentially harness the power of moving water and transform it into usable electricity. And I went through tons of prototypes, most of them didn't work, but I learned way more from the failures in this process than I ever did from the successes. And it helped me so much in my science journey to experiment. Something else that I learned from this is the importance of collaboration in science. Reaching out to mentors who knew way more than I ever did about science helped me solve my problems way quicker than I could have on my own. So here you see kind of the pro 
prototyping process, and eventually I came out with a prototype that worked pretty well. So it spins and spins a generator which rotates magnets inside, and that generates electricity. So you can see that it lights up an LED light system here. So this was a super fun development process, and developing Beacon was one of the most fun times I ever had. I had a science teacher in eighth grade who inspired my love of science early on, Miss Suzette Malou. If there are any teachers in the room, can I just embarrass you and have you stand up for a minute? Because we want to celebrate you, so applaud your teachers, please, if they're here. As science students, some of our greatest resources are our teachers. If you haven't already, reach out to your teachers with your crazy ideas, because like my teacher, a lot of times they'll be really encouraging of your ideas and wanting to solve problems. And Ms. Malou did that for me. She encouraged me to enter the Discovery Education and 3M Young Scientist Challenge with my project. I submitted a two minute video about my research and was selected as a top 10 finalist. And over the summer, all of the finalists get to work with a mentor from 3M, and my mentor was Mr. Jeff M. Slander. And I learned a ton from telling him my ideas and him telling me how I could improve my project, and it helped a lot. I got to go to the final event, and at the end of the week, I was named America's 2015 Top Young Scientist. That was an amazing experience, and I thought that week must have been the best week of my life. But nothing could have prepared me for what was to follow. I got to travel around the world, meet really cool people, and some of the most cool people that I met were the other young scientists doing research just like I was. I've learned so much from research experiences where there are other other kids in the room who are doing science research that's impactful and cool. Now something that I've learned throughout my science journey is that problems are everywhere and there are so many different problems that we can solve. My junior year I decided to try to solve another problem which was the problem of chemical spills around the world. My uncle is in the military and he has to deal with chemical spills all the time. So I built a low cost sensor that could detect isopropyl alcohol in a small ventilated environment. So I built this sensor and it worked pretty well but it's not a project that I would consider worked extremely well but it was a great learning experience for me to experiment and try another problem and really learn from my failures. So this um, fall, I was paired with another faculty research mentor, Dr. Marion Porter, and my research advisor at my school, FAU High School, Dr. Trisha Meredith, had been trying to get me involved with shark research for a really long time, but I just didn't really see a problem that I wanted to solve using sharks. I couldn't make that connection. But pairing me with Dr. Porter was one of the coolest things that ever happened. So I was studying the biomechanic properties of shark skin under Dr. Porter, and biomechanics is like the way that something moves. So I was stretching shark skin, I was kind of stabbing it with different things on this machine, and I was trying to see how it would react to different forces. And this was a really interesting project, but I wasn't super engaged with it because I wasn't solving a problem. I was trying to contribute to the body of literature around shark skin. And something that really sparks my um, passion for science every time is solving a problem. So if you're in science and you can't really get your interest going and you're just kind of stabbing shark skin because everyone does that, <laughs> try to find a problem to solve because application is everything. So in the fall of October, um, my dad had an operation that led to a surgical site infection. And surgical site infections impact a ton of people around the world, over 20 million people in the US every year, and about 200 million people around the world every year. And the majority of these are concentrated in underdeveloped countries, just like the one that my friend Ruth lives in. So I wanted to find a simple solution to this problem. And in order to do that, I began by speaking to doctors who explained that pathogens can migrate from any contaminated surface Surface, such as a bandage, a healthcare practitioner's gloves, or even a patient's own skin surrounding their wound, these pathogens can migrate into the wound. And this causes a repository for these bacteria to kind of accumulate and group up. And this causes infection in susceptible patients with compromised immune systems. So I thought, OK, if we can stop this pathogen migration initially, then maybe we can prevent these surgical surgical site infections from happening in the first place. So that's what I set out to do. And this is when I made the connection between my shark research and between um, patient health in a hospital. So sharks have these denticles, which are tiny little scales that change shape around the body. And they're really interesting because they're microscopic. And during the shark research period I was doing, I was reading a ton of research papers where scientists would say, shark skin is anti-fouling. And I was like, OK, what is anti-fouling? What does that mean? And fouling is a settlement of marine microorganisms on wet surface. 
surfaces. So has anyone seen like barnacle buildup on the side of a boat, like in Nemo, where there's that algae everywhere on the side of the tank? So um, that's what scientists believe that this little micro pattern can prevent. So the first part of my project was trying to figure out, OK, does shark skin prevent this bacteria from building up? And in order to test that, I submerged 25 shark skin samples in this ocean flow water tank at um, Gumbo Limbo Nature Center. So this pulls water from the ocean, cycles it through the tank, and then spits it back out into the ocean. And so I submerged 25 shark skin samples from the black tip shark and 25 petri dish samples, um, which had no micro pattern. They were flat, and they served as a control. So what I found was that after 120 hours, the petri dishes actually fouled a lot. They had a ton of really gross bacteria all over the place. But the shark skin, even though it was from a decaying organism, fouled barely at all. Less than 3% of the surface was covered, which definitely was shocking, but it proved our hypothesis that shark skin was anti-fouling. So with this foundation in mind, we moved on to create antibacterial bandages. And this brings up a good point, that trial and error is really, really important. And even though failure is frustrating in science, it is one of the best learning experiences you can have. So I started trying to copy this microscopic pattern with something called epoxy resin. It didn't work at all. It worked like this much, and then it just it couldn't pick up the micro pattern. But experimenting with different materials would really help me to develop an understanding of how to pick up these denticles. And eventually, I came to this material called an elastomer, which is like a polymer. It's called PDMSE. And this elastomer actually picked up the shark micro pattern really well. So in the bottom corner, corner here, you can see the PDMSE bandage that we made, which is really similar to the shark skin on the top. And on the other side, you can see the roughness comparison. Although it's not uniform, it is pretty rough considering the difference. And it's only one nanometer different from real shark skin. So that was a really, really cool thing that we were able to pick up that pattern. Now, in order to test this bandage, we use something called Staphylococcus aureus, or Staph aureus, which is an isolate in about 70% of surgical site infections. So it is a really, really big problem. So we use Staph aureus to try to see how the pathogens would migrate into a simulated wound, which is like a nutrient-dense environment from an auger petri dish. And so testing this migration allowed us to conclude that just the microstructure of the bandage, that shark skin microstructure, prevented the Staph aureus from coming into a simulated wound. So it was successful, and that was really, really cool that it was able to work. So all the way on the bottom right-hand side, you can see there's low colonies of Staph aureus compared to a real Band-Aid, which you would put on a cut right now, and compared to a flat control on the very top. So that was a really successful result. And this goes to show that it's okay to try new things. It's okay to experiment. And if you fail every once in a while, take it as an advantage, because it can help you learn a lot throughout your scientific process. Now, if you had told me five years ago that I would be up here talking to you about science, about shark skin, energy poverty, and about chemical sensing, I probably would have been like, what is that? Why? But this goes to show that you can try new things, and you can do anything that you set your mind to. Something that really helped me a lot beginning in science is surrounding myself with people who share similar interests and goals to me. This is my track team, my robotics team, and my robotics team from a few years ago. Being around people who had shared interests and values encouraged me so much in science. And if you're starting out, I encourage you to do the same and surround yourself with people who share similar passions to you. Thank you so much for having me.